Kennedy's predecessor, Dwight David Eisenhower, was the spiritual father figure of the greatest generation. A five-star general who became president, Ike led America through both the Second World War and the Cold War. During the 1950s, his boyish face and close-cropped hair became the outward symbol of the inward qualities American fathers sought to instill in their sons. To furnish a rising generation with the means to wage the coming war, President Eisenhower's administration combined domestic production and military preparedness into a single enterprise. Eisenhower dubbed it the Military Industrial Complex. Yet, despite their parents' best efforts to convince them otherwise, maturing boomers increasingly rejected war as a viable tool for settling international disputes and rebelled against the warrior culture their parents employed to steal them for it. Ultimately, both boomers and their parents wanted peace. It was their conflicting beliefs on how to obtain it that was the principal cause of friction between them. In 1960, Americans looked to their 42-year-old president to bridge this gap. A junior member of one generation and a senior member of the other, Kennedy was in a unique position to balance the views of both parties. War if necessary, but not necessarily war. That he came as close as he did to seeing through to the other side is evinced by the evolution of the speeches he delivered during his brief administration and why he is still so revered today. While the president-elect waited for his inauguration, the wheels of government continued to turn. On December 12th, the Supreme Court upheld a lower federal court ruling that the state of Louisiana's laws on racial segregation were unconstitutional and overturned them. Marvel Comics celebrated by introducing the Fantastic Four. On April 12, 1961, the Soviet Union launched 27-year-old Air Force pilot Yuri Gagarin into space. It was a magnificent achievement of stupendous technical proportions that shocked the West. While the Soviets were celebrating, Washington was focused on southern Cuba, where the Bay of Pigs invasion was only days away. Kennedy had been president for just three months and had authorized the operation based on the endorsement of his predecessor and the assurances of officials from the CIA. The invasion was a disaster. For Kennedy, it was time to take stock. America was arguably the most powerful nation in the world, and yet, despite its military superiority, it could not impose its ideology, leaving the U.S. with the conundrum. If the Cold War could not be won without resorting to nuclear war, how then could it be won and a just peace established? Ironically, it was Premier Khrushchev who provided the answer when he said to Vice President Richard Nixon during the aptly named 1959 kitchen debate that the system that will give the people more goods will be the better system and victorious. Well, this is absolute madness, Ambassador. Why should you build such a thing? There were those of us who fought against it, but in the end we could not keep up with the expense involved in the arms race, the space race, and the peace race. And at the same time, our people grumbled for more nylons and washing machines. At exactly what point Kennedy's thinking changed is not clear. But one thing is certain. After the Bay of Pigs, America began moving forward in a new way. President Kennedy's speech to Congress the following month publicly committed America to his new vision. America would definitively demonstrate to the rest of the world that free enterprise could produce better lives for its people and do it without, as was the case in the communist bloc, negating individual freedoms. Fortunately for Kennedy, the Soviets had also provided him with the ultimate means of proving it the space race. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. Now it was the USSR that was on the defensive. On August 13th, construction of the Berlin Wall began, ending emigration from East Berlin to West Berlin and forming a clear boundary between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Clearly, if the Soviet Union was a utopia, they would not have to wall their people in. But if America was going to present itself to the Cold War world as a paragon of progress with prosperity and freedom for all, she needed to put her own house in order. On December 14, 1961, the Presidential Commission on the Status of Women was established with Eleanor Roosevelt as chairperson. On September 23, 1962, one of the first signs the American public had committed to the space race appeared when The Jetsons, a primetime animated sitcom produced by Hanna-Barbera, aired on ABC. Befitting the nature of its New Age content, The Jetsons was the first program ever broadcast in color on ABC. 
Although its predecessor, the Flintstones, had also been produced in color, it had been broadcast exclusively in black and white. While Americans were watching television, a small group of U.S. servicemen were busy watching developments in other places. On October 14, 1962, a U-2 spy plane took pictures of Soviet nuclear missile installations under construction in Cuba. On October 22nd, President Kennedy interrupted primetime programming to reveal the threat to the American people and announce his administration's plan to confront it. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. The address produced anxiety in many European countries, but here at home, most accepted the need to take action and prepared for the worst. There were runs on stores and supermarkets as Americans bought up batteries and other provisions and stored them away in their basements or backyard shelters. On October 23rd, SAC was ordered to DEFCON 2 in anticipation of the confrontation between U.S. Navy and Soviet cargo vessels the following day. The world held its breath. Fortunately for everyone, the Soviet ships turned back before reaching the line of demarcation, leaving America to, once again, search for other means to combat communism. Means such as those expressed by Andy Warhol. Warhol was one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. The quintessence of Warhol's genius was not his understanding of how America had used mass production and technological innovation to provide its armies and allies with the means to win the Second World War. It was how these same elements could be used to secure the peace. In 1962, Warhol founded The Factory, an art studio where he employed art workers to mass produce prints and posters of everyday household items, such as Campbell's Soup, Brillo Pads, and Coca-Cola. Warhol had not only watched the Nixon-Khrushchev kitchen debate, he had grasped its underlying message. For Warhol, the proof of America's greatness was not in the pudding, it was the pudding. Opined Warhol, what's great about this country is that America started the tradition where the richest consumers buy essentially the same things as the poorest. You can be watching TV and see Coca-Cola, and you know that the president drinks Coca-Cola, Liz Taylor drinks Coca-Cola, and just think, you can drink Coca-Cola too. A Coke is a Coke, and no amount of money can get you a better Coke. All the Cokes are the same, and all the Cokes are good. Nine years later, Coca-Cola took the idea worldwide when it introduced its new advertising spot, I'd like to buy the world a Coke. Like Kennedy's thinking, Warhol's vision had come full circle. Coke was more than just a popular recreational beverage. It was a universal symbol of American culture, a culture which began by asserting that happiness and peace are a corollary of social equality. But in the early 1960s, America continued to fall short of its own promise. On Christmas Day 1962, Universal Pictures released To Kill a Mockingbird, based on Harper Lee's Pulitzer Prize winning novel. The film was shot in black and white to better portray the story's setting and accentuate its central theme. Essentially, both the novel and the film assert that people should base their judgment of others on actions, not their outward differences or similarities. America's denial of equal rights for blacks and other minorities was a cankering sore that hurt its own people and detracted from John Winthrop's vision of America as a shining city on a hill at the very time she was striving to project a positive image to countries caught up in the Cold War. Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique, published a few months later, contributed additional fuel to this same fire through its study of the lives of America's housewives and mothers, their dissatisfaction with the increasingly stereotypical roles they were playing, and the systemic discrimination that discouraged them from pursuing other choices or voicing dissent. Today, Frieden's book is widely credited with sparking the beginning of second wave feminism. With the threat of nuclear war hanging constantly over their heads and the average American helpless to do anything about it, viewers in the early 60s sought escapism in spy-based movies and television shows in which charismatic secret agents single-handedly rescued the world from catastrophe. On May 8, 1963, Dr. No was released in America. Popular television shows from the same period included The Man from UNCLE, I Spy, and Mission Impossible. Parodies on the spy genre such as Our Man Flint starring James Coburn as master spy Derek Flint and Get Smart starring Don Adams as Maxwell Smart were also popular. The spy genre filtered down to younger boomers in the form of Rocky and Bullwinkle and spy toys aimed predominantly at boys. 